Streaming now at KDOW.biz and Radio.com. The views and opinions expressed by Rob Black and his guests are not necessarily those of KDOW or its management owners or advertisers and should not be construed as legal tax or investment advice. Always consult with the appropriate advisor before making any investment or financial planning decision. Insightful. Informative. Irreverent. We're ready. 1220 KDOW presents Rob Black and Your Money, your source for breaking news, market updates, and successful investment strategies for the 21st century. Sounds like a great program. Getting you to retirement in today's market. So let's get on with the show. Taxes, family finance, insurance, the economy, technology, media, and entertainment. Rob is talking about it with you at 800-516-1220. So call in. We'll chat and uh, have some fun. Now to start your day with the latest news and market commentary. Here's Rob Black on the Bay Area's business leader, 1220 KDOW. Got a special guest for you today that we need to talk with about wealth issues. CFP Chad Burton. You can find him at chadburton.com. Mr. Burton, it is a wonderful time of the year. Tax time. Uh, tax time keeps you very busy as a certified financial planner. It's obviously a big component of your client's wealth every year to kind of check in, pay their proper taxes, and put into perspective how much they earned, how much they paid, and how much they saved. How does a good CFP get involved in the actual tax return? Because those are kind of private documents to me, if that makes sense. Yeah, it does make sense. It's for a good certified financial planner that's dealing with everything, not just the investments, but the entire picture. It's it's a puzzle. It helps put all the pieces together and, and really come up with good advice because, you know, when you're going to, especially into retirement, you go from that idea when you're working, which I've got to pay the least amount of taxes as possible this year, to the idea of I've got to keep my taxes lower for longer. I've got to look 30 years, 40 years into the future as long as I'm going to retire and make sure that I'm not making any mistakes and deal with any tax strategies that I can do now before taxes go up. Um, because, Rob, we just had a huge third round, essentially, of stimulus Mm-hmm. Um, we're getting another fiscal package that's going to be huge coming down the line. Taxes are going up in the future. This is, this math is not working the way it is right now. There's just no way uh, unless we really grow out of this. And I think we're have we're going to have an amazing year of growth of GDP growth. But you know, will it kind of fizzle out in 2022 or not? We'll see. But I think taxes are going to go up because they're lower now than they've ever been in the 26 years I've been doing this. So we had a really wacky tax year last year. So 2020, there's a lot of rule changes because of COVID and you know, Secure Act and uh, all these different things that are going on with COBRA and uh, unemployment. And uh, their last year, retirees did not have to take a required minimum distribution from their IRAs. So it was so crazy that the IRS came in and said, okay, we're going to do the extension. The taxes are no longer due on April 15th. They're due May 17th to give people more time. And, but by the way, your estimated taxes are still due on April 15th. Even though your tax return isn't due till May 17th, your estimated payments are still due by 415, you know, April 15th. Well, that's silly because you, pr- if the, if the estimated taxes are due, you pretty much have to do your return almost in its entirety in order to figure out how much you're going to have to pay by April 15th. So I want people to realize that they still need to make that payment. And for a while, we didn't, until two days ago, Rob, we didn't have clarity on the extension. Okay, well, if the extension for taxes is due May 17th, does that mean we have until May 17th to do our IRAs and Roth IRAs and things like that? And finally, we do. You do have an extension on those. Okay. A lot That's of a good thing, right? If they, yeah, yeah. Mind. It's definitely a good thing because people make that mistake all the time. They'll, they'll file extensions all the way until October of this year. Um, but even no matter if you file an extension or not, you have to hit that IRA and Roth IRA deadline, which is May 17th this year. So don't, uh, mess up with that. Um, and this is also Rob, the first year that you can go retroactive for self-employed people or for a business with okay. a profit sharing plan or a defined benefit plan. What's Usually those documents have to be done by the end of the year. 
Okay. Yes, you're right. Okay. I see. I'm picking up what you're throwing out there. <clears throat> so corporations have a little bit more flexibility to reward. Um, I don't like the word reward. Corporations have a little bit more flexibility to drop a little bit more money on employees. It sounds like, and uh, maybe save a little bit more for retirement, which is, has to be a good thing in my mind. Yeah. Yeah. One of the good things if you're a business owner and you're trying to get a tax deduction for 2020 and you realize you should have put a 401k in place, even if it's just a safe harbor 401k, which at most you might match up to 3% of an employee's pay, you can throw in a profit sharing plan for last year, get a deduction. If it works out for you, you got to figure out how much the deduction is worth versus how much you pay for your employees. And then just add to that document a 401k provision for 2021 and, and beyond. And so that's got a lot of people really, really busy. And then we just have to make sure that the tax preparer captured everything, like IRA to Roth conversions, uh, gifting, uh, low cost basis shares, and you know self-employed retirement contributions. A lot of that stuff doesn't show up very well on the reporting from custodians. So it has to be a really team effort uh, between your advisor, you, and your tax preparer. And that's one of the reasons why now that we are EP wealth that we have taxes in house for people that we can do those returns in house as part of the financial planning fee that we charge. That's definitely a trend to put more services in house, whether it be wills and estates and trusts, but taxes are clearly an important part because I'll be honest, Chad, I'm considered wealthy and I don't know what I can deduct this year. Do I get unemployment income taxes there? Like you said, there's just been a slew of things thrown out for many Americans that it's tough to track. And that's why you kind of want a CPA on top of a CFP and having them work together going across the office helps a lot. But if not, obviously you have a lot of more work cut out for you in the processing of this. Um, are you able to keep up with all the tax credits? I mean, how, how hardcore are you into tax issues versus hiring a tax person and using a tax person? Oh, I'm really hardcore in it. I mean, as, as certified financial planners, we have to do continuing education and I always try to look for the tax courses on it. And a lot of C CFP certified financial planners I know are also enrolled agents. Okay. Especially there's several here at EP Wealth, um, which means they can actually prepare tax returns. So the, the, the issue is, is that CFPs that we spend, the investment side is almost the easy side. The market's going to take care of us. We've got, you know, a great team of analysts watching babysitting positions. A lot of it is just keeping your wealth, making sure you're not making any tax mistakes, especially for the long run. So when I look at a tax return, I, I, this is a busy time of year because it's like, okay, this is what happened in 2020. And this is, this is, let's look at your mortgage, right? Let's yes. look at the deductions that you have on your schedule A. Are your itemized deductions larger than the new standard deduction, which is 12,400 if you are single or 24,800? So everybody starts off with this standard deduction. And the only time you okay. switch to itemized deductions are as if uh, your main deductions are larger than that number. So let's say you're married filing jointly, Rob, and your, your standard deduction is 24800 If you want to itemize your main deductions, which are your mortgage interest, only $10,000 of state uh, income and property taxes, your qualified uh, unreimbursed medical expenses that are over 7.5% of your adjusted gross income, and charitable gifting. And that's about it. So those four main things have to be higher than your standard deduction for you to itemize. So if you're not itemizing, this helps us determine if a mortgage is truly a deduction for you. And with rates so low on mortgages, um, maybe if you're 10 years or less from retirement, you should be focusing on getting rid of that mortgage and paying that off instead of investing in bonds. So if a person's super heavy in stocks, and they're like, well, I need to invest in bonds, but we're in a rising rate environment where the average bond fund is down 3.5% this year and rates are likely to continue to slowly edge up. Let's get rid of that mortgage, you know, mm -hmm. over the, the next 10 years. And I mean, help us. Yep. I was going to say, I'm in that scenario where, again, I have a second home and it's got a 3.5% mortgage. I could pay it down and instead of earning 3.5% in a bond, I could earn three and a half percent by saving three and a half percent. Is that the right idea? We've got 30 seconds. Yeah, that's definitely the right idea. And, and then, you know, after the break, let's go through, you know, several of the other things, especially charitable gifting that we help come up with much better strategies for, okay. um, because the tax return, it helps us put a puzzle together for sure. Speaking with CFP, Chad Burton about taxes, EP wealth, how a tax plan works with a financial plan and much, much more. <laughs> 
portions of our programming are brought to you by our good friends at Provident Credit Union. With 21 Bay Area locations to serve you and your banking needs, visit ProvidenceCU.org. Now back to Rob Black and your money with your host, Rob Black, on the Bay Area's business leader, AM 1220 KDOW. Can't knock the hustle. A little side gig action here and there. Gig economy. Don't forget you have to pay taxes on it. Because it flows into your cash and your bank account a little bit faster. Does it mean you don't have to pay the taxes? We're speaking with CFP Chad Burton. You can find him at chadburton.com. We're talking a little bit about how CFPs get into the nitty gritty and the tax planning of clients. I love the idea of having a team approach. Something Chad and I have talked about for 20 plus years, having a team of proper people in place will help you hit those financial goals probably a little bit faster. When we last left off, Chad, we were talking about deductions and what things that you look for, like mortgages and how much uh, in your state taxes, adjust gross income. I think you were kind of leading that into when you're out of options, maybe go into gifting or maybe go into alternatives like paying off a second home or paying down a mortgage so you're not paying that 3.5% 30-year mortgage. You're, you're saving on that 3.5%, which accrues. Um, is that kind of where we left off? Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of questions that you have. First of all, if you're at 3.5%, that's even the rate where you should probably consider a refi, right? You can get under 3, even on a 30-year, especially on a 15 so as you get close to retirement, you're kind of like, all right, well, is my mortgage deductible now? And if it is, if it isn't, that, that's one thing. But will it likely be deduct- deductible when I retire? Because the standard deduction is so high. Again, it's 12400 if you're single or 24800 if you're married. And there's a little bit more on there if you're 65 or older. But for for you to be able to itemize and actually get a tax benefit from your mortgage, you have to be itemizing. And the only way you itemize is if your itemized deductions are higher than the standard deduction. So you add up your mortgage, 10000 of your state income taxes and property taxes. That's the limit because of SALT li- limits, uh, state and local income tax deduction limits. Any unreimbursed medical expenses over 7.5% of your income and charitable gifting. So people think that they're getting deductions and then they're just not. They're just going to the standard deduction now because it was so high since the 2017 tax act. And unless you're over 400,000, I doubt anything Biden's going to do is going to affect that. So as you get close to retirement, people look at their entire situation and they say, okay, I, I, maybe I'm equity heavy. Maybe I have 80, 90% in stocks and I know I'm heading towards retirement and I have to have some fixed income exposure, some bonds, some more safety in my portfolio. But then they're looking at their bond funds and their 401k saying, these things are down 3% or more for for the year because interest rates are rising. And they're still at historical lows. Bonds are still paying a quarter of what your parents got when they retired on bonds. Yeah, that's something. Isn't that crazy? So, so you kind of look at it and say, okay, there, there's a couple of options when you are equity heavy going into retirement. You either funnel all of your 401k and other saving contributions into the world of bonds, or you okay. could say, you know what, instead I'm going to pay down my mortgage so that I don't have that cash outflow at retirement. That creates a better la- another layer of safety, for example. And, um, and then you could be looking at your portfolio and say, I need to reduce equity exposure. Well, if it's a taxable account, you could sell – some of your stocks and your concentrated position maybe at the company you work for. Just take the capital gains hit now while capital gains taxes are so very low and pay off the mortgage if it's not deductible. Or in your 401k, uh, another option for equity reduction is you could reduce some equity exposure and go into maybe a stable value fund, which is yielding about the same as bond funds but has much less interest rate risk. So a tax return can actually help lead into that discussion of, okay, I'm, I'm retiring. How do I reduce risk in my overall plan? Um, and then if you want, we can kind of get into what we look for for the gifting and the charitable options as well. Yeah, let me digest this for a second. There's a lot going on. Roth conversions, self-employment options, um, carry forward losses. A lot of people do have big questions on taxes. So I, I, I see why you're doing this. Can I throw down something that's going to shock you a little bit? As sure. I turn 50, I want less and less and less to do with this kind of decision-making. 
to the point that I ignore it. You know that about me. Sometimes I ignore the obvious. Um, mm-hmm. Do you run into yeah. that with anybody else? Um, as far as financial planning, it's like, I got my stocks. I don't have my bonds. I'm, I'm good. I'm good. I don't need, I don't need to, to financially engineer this. And you're talking a little financial engineering for the positive, whereas I'm, I'm afraid of financial engineering. I don't like change. Change freaks me out. Yeah, and it, it's kind of one of those things where you you for a while, right? And this is why we give people information on how to kind of build their first two hundred fifty to five hundred thousand dollars. Because you get on autopilot, you're maxing out your four hundred one k, you're doing a Roth. We've got that mega Roth four hundred one k flow chart that we can hand people. There's some great savings options. So that's a way to build wealth, and you can put that wealth wealth building on autopilot. But once you get to the realm of, hey, I'm over 50, I'm going into retirement, you have to think about taxes, risk reduction, making your money last longer than you do, um, and and keeping taxes low for the entire period of your retirement. Because what catches people off guard is at 72, you are forced to pull money out of your IRAs, 401ks, 403bs. You're forced to pull money out. You don't have any choice. And you start losing control of your taxes. So... You have to front run that. You have to deal with Got it. that IRA tax time bomb, as a guy named Ed Slot puts it, from the date of retirement until you turn 72. And there's a lot of options there. And um, so coming up, look at the tax return and looking at strategies between even charitable gifting and Roth conversions is really important going into retirement. Let's talk a little bit about gifting because this hits me right at home. Um, I personally don't want to gift a lot while I'm still young and vibrant because I don't know if I'm going to hit a point where I need more of that. And then I see someone like George Clooney give away a million dollars to 19 of his best friends while he's living. He's gifting it. He's enjoying the benefit of it. Probably tax wise. Now again, he's got a billion dollars for selling his uh, vodka company or his uh, tequila company. But what's your thoughts on better ways of gifting? And we have about two minutes in this segment, so we may have to carry it into the next segment. Save your cash. Stop giving cash. If you're giving over $500 to a charity, stop giving cash. If you have a taxable account, let's say you work for Apple and your RSU is vested years ago and you've got a bunch of shares of Apple and you give $500 or more to the same charity every single year, transfer them a few shares of Apple for the same amount. You get the same tax deduction. What's that? Is that easy to do? Yeah. Yeah. We just, you just do a, you call up the charity, you say, what's your brokerage account information? And then we just do a letter of instruction that the client signs and the shares transfer to that brokerage account. They get the same tax deduction and okay. they get rid of their capital gains tax. And then they, if they want the stock, they can still buy it back with cash. They just upgraded their capital gains. They, so everybody wins. The charity wins. They don't pay taxes when they go to sell that stock you gave them. You get rid of the capital gains problem and, uh, and you still get the deduction. So, I would look at that route if you have a taxable account with low cost basis shares of any kind in it. The other one, Rob, and we may need to hold this over to the next segment, is I run into people constantly now that gift five, ten thousand dollars a year, but because they are no longer itemizing their deductions, they are no longer getting a deduction for that gift. Does that make sense? Yes. So their gift plus plus their mortgage and ten K of state tie. If that doesn't exceed twenty four thousand eight hundred and they're still giving to charity, they're not getting a benefit of it. So Let's hold this. That we're going to talk about refunds. We're going to talk after the break. Yeah. Yeah. We're going to talk about this and much, much more after the break. You can find Chad at chadburton.com. That's chadburton.com. Visit Rob Black online at robblack.com. Now, back to Rob Black and your money on AM 1220 KDOW. I'm Rob Black, talking all things financial. I'm sitting in with CFP Chad Burton today, or he's sitting in with me, talking about tax season and how it's been extended to May 17 this year and how he and I did a lot of research to join a group called EP Wealth. One of the benefits is that they've got tax people that work side by side with certified financial planners like Chad Burton. It's a lot to process talking taxes on radio, not always the easiest thing, but he's doing a real nice job. Let's bring him back to talk a little bit more. I believe when we last left off, we were in the world of gifting, but we may have drifted into 
um, using corporate stock and ESPPs. Um, where are we at in this conversation, Chad? Because taxes really overwhelm me as far as content digestion goes. Yeah, absolutely. I, I, so what we look for is CFPs. Um, when we look at a tax return, we always look at the Schedule A, the itemized deductions. And even if you don't itemize, if you end up with a standard deduction, um, you, the, the Schedule A still gets filled out to see if your itemized deductions are larger than the standard deduction. So when I look at the Schedule A, I look at the charitable donations, the charitable gifting of cash or anything else. And if I see a, a larger number, and I, I ask the person, I mean, is this something that you're doing every single year? Is this a goal of yours? And a lot of times it's yes. Um, it, so when we look at it, a situation like that, okay, we'll stop giving cash. We'll transfer shares of any highly appreciated stock. So let's say you have, again, shares of Apple or okay. Microsoft cool. or whatever. You're working for the company or RCU's vested. You've held them. They're really low cost basis. So if you sell them, you're going to get killed in capital gains taxes. So instead, transfer a few shares over to that charity. Almost every single nonprofit has a brokerage account that you can send the shares to electronically. They get the same amount of money. They can get the stock in kind. They sell it. They, they use the cash however they want to, and you still get the deduction. And if you want the stock, buy it back with cash, and you upgrade your cost basis. So you can donate away your cost basis. That's a lot of work in my or, head, but you make it sound easy. Yeah, so that's and that's especially that that's whether or not you're itemizing or not. That's still a better way to give. And the other way that I look at it, if somebody's beyond their age of required minimum distributions, so seventy and a half for some older people, so age seventy two, and I constantly see gifts to charity, we can set up a checkbook for a person's IRA, and a person can give up to a hundred thousand dollars from their IRA that has never been taxed directly to charity without paying taxes on it. So if you're over seventy two, that's by far the best way to give. So I'm thinking get rid of that. Go ahead. By far, that's the um, the best way to give if you're over 72. And then we can talk about if you're constantly giving, but now you're item you're not itemizing anymore. How do you get a deduction for all those gifts with a donor advised fund? This is a lot. <laughs> <laughs> I, I always thought my issue was: do I get a refund or not? And do I, <laughs> you know, I started doing quarterly installments on my taxes to get rid of that nightmare of how much how much am I going to owe at the end of the year. Um, I like using a CPA. I like using that um, professional, so to speak. Where should we go with this conversation? Okay, so let's say you look at your tax return because you're you're you know hearing this and you say, okay, uh -huh. I just got my tax return. I'm preparing my return, and I do give gifting all the time. And I you, you might be realizing, oh my gosh, I'm not because of the high standard deduction. I'm not getting a tax deduction for my gifts anymore. Okay. Well, the, the strategy for that would be if you're consistently giving, you can say, well, I'm always giving this amount. I'm giving $5,000 a year to my favorite charity or, or multiple charities. Maybe it's a bunch of different checks. The way to get an actual deduction of that is you look ahead, let's say five, 10 years, and you say, okay, I know I'm going to give twenty-five to $50,000 over the next five to 10 years. If that's the case, you can set up a donor advised fund. Schwab has one, Fidelity has fund, and you can let's say you want to do twenty five thousand over five years. And if you want to get a deduction for that, you can take twenty five thousand dollars worth of highly appreciated stock from your trust account or your joint account with your spouse, whatever it may be, and you can donate it into a donor advised fund that's in your name. You get an immediate tax deduction for that entire twenty five thousand dollars. And or more, depending on how much you're giving. But once that stock is in the donor advised fund, you can sell it without any capital gains taxes, reinvest it in a balanced portfolio, and then dole the money out to your favorite charities over any time frame that you want in, in really almost any amount. And so it, it, it's almost like, hey, I've just created my own foundation. I'm, I'm, you know, that, <laughs> that cool, I guess you could say. Yeah. Um, and so it, it just maximizes it for everybody. Um, I just want make, I want people to gift because it seems like the more people, my wealthier clients, the more they give, the more they end up getting back. I, I truly believe in that. But I want them to get the tax deduction for it as well. To show you the difference in people we are, I didn't know what tithing was. You taught me as a 35-year-old man what tithing was. 
and I was raised Catholic, which is, it, it doesn't make sense. That's when you give your church money on a regular basis, I think is the right idea. Yeah. Um, make sure that that church is a, is a, you know, 503C and they can, you can do the, these strategies, gifting shares, writing a check out of your IRA, um, if you're over 70 and a half, um, all sorts of good stuff like that. So make sure you're giving wisely. What's worse? Is it getting the big refund for you or having to pay at the end of the year? Like psychologically, and I guess fundamentally, you can answer it both ways if you want to. Yeah, it's kind of both ways. If it's if it's a if you're always getting a big big refund, you have to ask yourself: Was there better ways to put this money? Like, should I be doing more into my 401k or a mega Roth 401k or a Roth or backdoor Roth? That's silly, especially when the market's been going straight up since 2009. You've missed out on a lot of market returns by doing that. On the flip side of that, if you're always paying so much because you underwithheld, you're likely paying tax or penalties and interest. So that's probably the worst. Um, so, you know, part of work looking at a tax return is like, okay, maybe I should adjust my withholding from my paycheck to make sure that I'm doing just the right amount every year. Um, especially after you get a large raise or a bonus or something like that, or, you know, during the year you have a big capital gains event, like you sell a property or, uh, sell some stock, something like that. You know, what's interesting is my mother died in February and uh, me and my brother are doing her taxes for next year. Dying in December is a lot more convenient than dying in January for families. But again, that comes yeah. down to tax planning and it's just goofy to say out loud how taxes affect our, our lives on a regular basis. So, um, back to you. I, I just totally got digressed because taxes just make me goofy, Chad. It, it's, it loses me when you're like, are you getting a big refund or are you, are you paying through installments? And I like paying through installments now, but earlier in life, when I was in my 20s, I was like, I like a big refund because I'm going to invest it. Um, yep. But then I, you know, later in life, I'm like, I don't need to be hit with a surprise $100,000 tax bill. Well, how do I financially plan for that? But you're tying this all together well, so keep going, please. Yeah, so another one that we look at when the return is done, especially if we have a new client that comes in, is I look at the Schedule D. And the Schedule, Schedule D. D is where you report all of your gains and losses from trades in your taxable account, so your non-retirement accounts. So when you buy or sell stocks, bonds, beach fund, ETF, that's where it's you report, okay, here's how much I paid for it, here much, here's how much I sold it for. And believe it or not, I still run into people that – don't realize that they still have big carry forward losses from either the tech correction in 2000 and 2001. That is, they, they just got hammered and that's still, they still haven't used up those losses or wow. from the great recession. So they're sitting there worried about selling their highly concentrated stock at Apple or Cisco or Qualcomm or whatever, so a company that they work for thinking that they're so scared to sell it because they don't want to pay capital gains, but they have these carry forward losses and and they're not going to pay gains or they want to sell a rental property or sell their home and move and retire. So you got to look at the carry forward losses on the flip side of that. Did you by any chance hit on that article that uh, Christine Benz at Morningstar did about that Robin hood trader? I did not, but I think we all know a Robin hood trader too, who racked up a lot of trades, some wins, some losses. What did Christine Benz have to say about it? Well, she tweeted out, it was a, another person's article, I think. And it was talking about this Robin hood trader who, did over a million dollars worth of trades throughout the year, over a million dollars worth of trades on their Robinhood app, right? And their total profit for the year was $45,000. Okay. But because they didn't realize the realize gain loss rules and the how do you deduct a loss and what's called a wash sale, they had to report an $800,000 capital gains tax. So they, wow. they have to pay taxes on eight hundred thousand dollars of gains, Rob, but their net profit from all of their trading was only forty five grand. That's a great, great story because it doesn't make any sense to the average person. Um, it blows my mind to hear that out loud. But playing video games, Robin Hood, but doing it with real stocks and real money, that mm -hmm. adds up. And the IRS gets receipts on everything you won, and they get receipts on everything you lost. And you're telling me that the guy ends up with a tax bill of like $200,000. <laughs> exactly. It's nuts, man. And, and the same thing is happening with people that are trading cryptocurrency that just don't realize the tax loss. So, um, you know, that's kind of the second shoe to drop on, on a lot of this. Uh, we saw the same thing, Rob, in 99. 
Do you remember when we went to that, I think it was a cocktail party and that girl spent her last $5,000. She'd already been laid off tech wise. She spent her last $5,000 on trading software that gave a red light or a green light to buy or sell a stock. And she went to a seminar and spent her last $5,000 on it on a credit card. It's shocking. That, that's people, people were day trading back in 99, just like they're day trading now. And there's tax ramifications. I'm going to speak with Chad for one more segment. You can wait for it. You can also find him online at a podcast through chadburton.com, chadburton.com. This show will be available on his podcast, New Focus on Wealth with Chad Burton. You can find that at chadburton.com. Coming up, we're going to talk 8606, The Rise of the Robots, or is it a tax code? We'll find out with the CFP, Chad Burton. Sponsored by EP Wealth Advisors. Portions of our programming are brought to you by our good friends at Provident Credit Union. With 21 Bay Area locations to serve you and your banking needs, visit ProvidenceCU.org. Now back to Rob Black and your money with your host, Rob Black, on the Bay Area's business leader, AM 1220 KDOW. CFP, Chad Burton, and myself have been coming to you on a regular basis over the last 20 years. And last year, we joined forces with another group called EP Wealth. One of the things they offer is a financial planning experience tied with, amongst other things, a tax planning service. Um, it's a smart way to go uh, for wealth clients. If you need to learn more about what Chad Burton does specifically in this basis, you can contact him at chadburton.com. That's chadburton.com. You can also grab his podcast at that webpage and re-listen to the show because there's a lot of content in today's show. Um, Chad, I'm going to let you plug yourself in the last minute, but um, let's talk 8606 IRA basis. I don't even know what that is. I barely know what a 72T <laughs> is in the tax code. Um, what's an 8606 IRA basis? Sure, yeah. Well, so laws changed many years ago that said if you have a, a 401k at work, your ability to deduct your IRA contributions is gets phased out. So a lot of people still continue to add money to their IRA, but we're never able to deduct it. And that actually creates a cost basis in your IRA that shows up on form 8606. And sometimes people forget to kind of carry that forward in a return or especially if they change CPAs. So it might be in an old form, but let me give you an example of one that we found the other day. So we were bringing on a new client and, uh, the 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 wife had a 401k at work, but she also had an IRA for $130,000, and she had made several years worth of non-deductible contributions in it, almost $30,000 worth. And so what we were able to do is roll the non the, the growth out of her IRA to her company 401k plan, and all that was left over was that $30,000 basis that showed on the 8606. That was all that was left over in her IRA. So we're able to convert that tax-free to a Roth. So now it's going to grow tax-free for the rest of her life. So, you know, if money tends to double every 10 years in the market, 30 becomes 60, 60 becomes 120, 120 becomes 240,000 tax-free dollars by the time retirement's around. Um, so that's important to look at as well, because I think there's some some tricks out there um, and then that'll also allow her to, uh, they make too much money to do a Roth Rob. So by doing that, by getting rid of her IRA account, she can now do a backdoor Roth IRA tax free every year and still get a Roth. And I've got flow charts on that for people on, you know, can I fund a Roth IRA? Do I, do I make too much? If I make too much, can I fund a backdoor Roth IRA? I've got two great flow charts that you can send me an email, chat at chadburton.com and I'll send them out to you. It's chad at chadburton.com. Flow charts, that's something new um, when it comes to financial planning. I don't think I've ever heard you use that term until the last 52 weeks. Um, what other things are you working on right now that we need to be aware of? Well, it's still, I feel like I've you know beat this drum for so long now. We even had for a while on the podcast the mega backdoor 401k you know, announcement kind of thing because I was talking about it so much. But um, by f people are still missing this, Rob. They still don't know about it. So I'm going to say it okay. again. It's the best savings vehicle you can do. If you're, 
your cash flow is high enough where, okay, I've, I maxed out my 401k. That's 19,500 or, or 27,000. If you're going to be 50 or older by the end of the year, I've maxed that out. I've done a Roth or a backdoor Roth and I still have extra cash to save. I can still save more money and I'm trying to catch up. And that's typically when people are over 50, right? Their, their kids are out of college. That expense is gone. They're trying to get caught up and save for retirement. So the next thing that you want to look for is what's called the mega backdoor Roth 401k. So let me give you a quick example before we run out of time. What people don't realize is that for if you're 50 or older, the total amount that can actually go into a 401k in 2020 uh, is in 2021 is uh, 63,500. And that's made up by your deferrals, your employer match, and your after-tax contribution if your plan allows it. That's the key. Does your plan allow it? So if a person was over 50 and they were trying to save a ton of money, they could they could put in 27000 pre-tax. Okay. And let's say they get an employer match that's $8,000. That leaves another 28500 left to get to that maximum limit that I mentioned of 63500 So we have clients putting that amount into the after-tax bucket that's in their 401k, places like Apple, Cisco, Microsoft, um, KLA 10 Core. Uh, they're, they're putting that in after tax and it's getting converted tax free to their Roth bucket inside their 401k. So we seriously have people putting twenty, thirty thousand dollars $30,000 a year away into their Roth account that again is growing tax free forever. And once that's rolled to a Roth IRA at retirement, there's no required minimum distributions. It doesn't affect social security taxation, doesn't increase your Medicare premiums. It is by far the best way to save. And so again, another flow chart, I should have a flow chart of all the flow charts we have, but another flow chart that you have on the mega uh, Roth 401k. How do you, can you do it? The questions to ask your employer. And I like flow charts almost like you like pie charts of how much you like pie. You're right? stealing my jokes and that's not, that's I know, not acceptable on the show. It, so I just, I just had to take it from, so. I can write some material for you if you want me to. Flow charts. I need flow it. Charts. Um, well, sounds good. And people still have time to figure this out and people can get a copy of this podcast by going to chadburton.com. We've got about a minute or two. Anything that you need to plug, push or promote? Um, how, you know, I've got to, you know, post merger, get this, uh, with, with EP. We got to get the webinars and seminars back going. Can't wait to meet our listeners again. Uh, but That's if you go to chadburton.com, you can find out all about our services. We're fee only financial planning. We do everything, college planning, your estate, including trust, wills, power of attorneys, tax return, investment management, um, insurance analysis, all of all of, like it's it's so comprehensive. There's never been more deliverables that we've had, and it's all part of financial planning fees. Um, and so check it out. Just go to chadburn.com and and uh, look at what we are doing now and all the services that we have. Well, thanks for joining me, and don't let it be another 100 days before we do a, our show again, because it's always fast and furious, filled with information. You can find Chad at chadburton.com. That's B-U-R-T-O-N.com. Lots going on with tax season. I know it's stressful. I've kind of admitted myself. Um, I'm kind of slow to embrace the change of tax progressive policies in my own plan, but they do exist. You can find Chad at chadburton.com. <laughs> 